climate change. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to move on to that. <laughs> Segue. Okay. So um, we will start now. We're a little couple of minutes late. It doesn't matter. Um, just before we um, go over to Vanessa Kran, who has um, joined us from Gerard Bertrand Winery, which I'm a big fan of the wines, and hopefully I won't take over this session like I did last week. Um, <laughs> and we'll we'll uh, get all your questions through as well. Um, just before we do, um, I just wanted to um, talk to Amelia because um, she is currently in a bit of a um, messy place not personally but in terms of geographically right now so in terms of what's going on over there do you want to just give us a little bit more information because i don't think we're getting everything that you're seeing yes no thank you and um so much and thank you so much for giving people the option to donate to those two different charities the george floyd memorial fund as well as um the race, uh, the, the red card against racism, um, educational charity. Um, I thought it was very important. Um, it's so difficult right now to articulate. I, like my last big post on Instagram was like, I find it very hard to articulate the right kind of words. Like, and I put major disclaimer because I think it will take a while. Um, but yes, um, ever since George Floyd um, was murdered last week by a police officer at first they said it wasn't he had underlying health issues but now it's become very true that it was due to asphyxiation um there have been protests throughout the country and i must say the majority of them are extremely peaceful um but definitely like in la here unfortunately which doesn't get covered in the news so much is that the riots and the looting it's, that's completely different from the peaceful protesting going on, which is like the peaceful protests I'm all for, and that's what a really great cause. And even when I first moved to LA about a year and a half ago, I was quite shocked at how segregated it was as a um, city, geographically where people lived, and also in industries too, in media and, and in hospitality. Um, yes, you might see people in front of the screen in media, but people making big decisions, not so much people of color. Um, and, in hospitality, you do see some Hispanics, you do see a couple of people of color, but not a huge me, because I, oh, West, South, that's the real issue. But I, I kind of see this enlightened, very creative boho place. And they're already, you know, they have a huge homeless issue, mainly blacks. Um, and in terms of now, like even with COVID showing up, it's just really clear to see that they're, them and, actually you know kind of other um minority marginalized minorities are also being affected so it was already building up and i could already just feel like it wasn't i don't know i saw a side to um to america which i never really anticipated before even though being half american i'd always have holidays here i had lots of different kinds of friends here but living here i've noticed the divide and it is kind of you know and i, I talked to about friends you know talked to friends about it and they said no it is actually a very segregated city and um it's something which, um, I don't know, I always felt that the US was a kind of pressure cooker. And I think George Floyd's death, plus that incident in New York with the woman screaming to the, you know, the white woman, uh, Amy, Cum oh, Amy Cummings, Amy, I can't, I can't, I just had a senior moment, um, you know, shouting at the black man for asking her to put her dog on a lead just because she fully knew her power as a white woman still you know, with the police. Um, I think there were like a couple of incidents which sparked off the back of COVID. People are frustrated, people, um, there's a huge unemployment rate in LA too. We've got the highest, like about 29% are unemployed. And a lot of that does tend to be people who um, work in restaurants and things and who are people of color and um, and they've been severely affected by that. And of course that then affects their chances of you're not being able to maybe get the healthcare they need. Anyway, that being said, it all kind of really got exacerbated in the last few days, sorry, I'm rambling. And um, now we've having some amazing peaceful protests going on, but off the back of the protests, lots of rioting and looting have been happened by kind of organized crime, thugs of all colors. I actually see a lot of white thugs and white looters on the news um, and it's got nothing to do with the protests it's just people who 
know that they can get away with taking advantage of this very, 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 very turbulent, tumultuous situation. Um, and so, yeah, we've, uh, I never thought I'd see a SWAT team outside my bedroom window. We've had national, like we've had the tanks rolled in, um, about four or five days ago, we've had National Guard um, because we're having five demonstrations. And what's really disgusting is that they'll say, oh, these five demonstrations happen in our area, it's Black Lives Matter. Then you go to the Black Lives Matter website and you see that it's not on the website. So then you know that it's organized crime, organized by people who know that there's demonst like peaceful protests happen in the area. And while the police's attention are all on the protests, they can then choose high-end retail uh, areas to loot and riot and just cause disruption. So it's really like sad because I, and I, I've been actually taking some time like off social media or only using it not to really talk about wine, but really just to kind of think like, how can we actually make sure that money, time, energy is going to the right cause? And also just trying to tell my friends in the UK, when you hear about this rioting and looting like it's got nothing to do with the protests because i just don't think there's been much coverage at least not in the mainstream newspapers on instagram yes and um on various online platforms yes but definitely in the main newspapers people didn't realize quite what was happening and the nuances which were going on in the bigger cities um it does seem to be calming down um in terms of wine like yesterday was uh, international sommelier day and i think that was like a great day to kind of promote black owned wineries, black owned businesses, um, people of color, like sommeliers, or, you know, um, my friend Char, she's got an amazing, um, she did an amazing talk with some other black sommeliers in the industry, just talking about actually your business should reflect the ethics and the ethos you want your, you know, your, your business should look like how your, the ethics um, you want your business to run. So I, I you know, it's, it's been very turbulent. I love the fact that the main officers now have been charged with second degree murder and now all the four officers implicated in the crime are all being charged. So that's great. Um, we're just urging people to go out and vote because it's the primaries in the States, but it's, it's just awesome how actually just the whole world has kind of picked up the baton and I definitely see a lot of like there's peaceful protests going on in England. There definitely seems it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's really fascinating. And you have to be careful what you say. I feel like I'm, I've been allowed because of my privilege to be like ignorant. I was sort of had black friends, you know, like da 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 da. You know, I'm a kind, like whatever person, and then you're just like, oh no, I really got it wrong here. I really got it wrong here. And actually, I'm in a very privileged position to have those kind of thoughts. And so, yeah, um, long and short of it is like um, I'm just like urging everyone to just educate, donate, and um, take peaceful actions and. Um, and I'm just hoping that 2020, like there's a reason for all this chaos, that it can only perpetuate some good. And I definitely um, think it's just amazing what it's been able to do, thanks to social media on a global scale of just really opening up everyone's eyes. But thank you everyone so much. Like so and I, we do put on these free masterclasses, but we did think it was important, particularly this week, particularly how things are kicking off and, and really trying to use our platform for good um, and, and be, you know, Soma and I pride ourselves on being communicators and, we really could not have done this masterclass, I think, without communicating what was on our minds, what's important, and how we wish to see the wine trade moving forward. Yeah, and I think something that, you know, us two talking together, we, we found quite difficult, like you say, in a privileged position, and, you know, how do we talk about what's going on without sounding, you know, superior or idiotic? Um, so patronizing yeah because i'm like i don't know yeah yeah so um to all of you attending we just wanted to um share that we are supporting these two charities um official george floyd memorial fund and the show races in the red card if you i mean you can find them yourselves but if you want to though on my homepage um at princessinthepinot.com if you would like to donate which we would appreciate um, but of course, you know, it's more about spreading the word and, you know, the main thing that I've been taking away from other people who do know more um, is to listen, to listen to what's going on, to listen to other people, be educated yourselves and spread the word about that. Thank you, Amelia. Sorry, it's a bit rambly. I'm <laughs> still trying to find the words and failing, as you can see, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard. 
Um, okay, so we um, thank you all for the um, for the little pause in our uh, wine tasting today. So we're going to um, go through three wines as uh, usual. Um, we're going through um, three that I've chosen because I think they're amazing. Um, I mean, all the wines I choose are amazing, or Amelia chooses <laughs> because that's why we've chosen them. But um, we've got the Picpoul de Pinay, which um, kind of I only recently discovered, I say recently in the past like three years or so. And then we've got the Hampton Water, which is the John Bon Jovi Rosé. And then we have St. Shinian, um, which is kind of like a really nice, robust um, red. So we'll go through three of those. If any of you want to, um, you know, just open up straight away, if you haven't already, um, start a glass. But um, Vanessa will be uh, going through all of those. And I think Vanessa's got a few things to show us as well as we go through. So, um, yeah, um, Vanessa Coran is the prestige director at Gerard Bertrand. So knows everything, I'm sure, and I feel very privileged to have her with us. Not at all, <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, there's just one slight error that I just want to point out is that I'm not actually at MW. It's my dream to be at MW, but <gasps> I, I never got I my- I read that somewhere and I was like, oh, that's oh. great. No, no, no. So I'm actually, I'm a, I did my diploma, my W to set diploma, and uh, I'm a certified sommelier from many years ago, but I'm not a MW, so. Oh, apologies. <laughs> I don't want to be. Get off, get yes. off. <laughs> so you can kick me out now. <laughs> But, but I know that the NW is an extremely, extremely challenging exam. I have a lot of friends who have either completed it or in the process of it. So I would never want to take that credit without having gone through the nightmare that I know that they're going through right now. So uh, maybe one day when my, my kid okay. gets and he's uh, less high maintenance. <laughs> it's the dream. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Soma and Amelia, for, for having me uh, here. Um, I understand that it's a very complicated time for everyone. Um, and so the best I can do tonight is to, well, tonight my time is to uh, invite you uh, on an airplane, <laughs> fantasy airplane to the south of France, uh, where we're going to uh, explore a few different uh, terroirs. And I really love the selection that uh, you both chose uh, for today. Uh, first of all, because when I poured them in my glass, it was really lovely to have a white and a rosé and a red. It just always looks beautiful to have the three colors together. So already aesthetically, I was very happy. And also, it, uh, it showcases the diversity of the south of France. So um, I'm actually originally from the south of France. You might be a little wondering why I have a, an accent, uh, because I sound very American or Canadian. Uh, I actually lived in Vancouver, which is on the west coast, for a very long time uh, as a child and as a, as a young adult. So that's where I picked up the, uh, the west coast accent. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm from not the Languedoc, but more closer towards the, uh, the Rhone region. Uh, originally, um, but the we have very similar grape varieties, and these are the the varieties that uh, run in my blood. So I feel a very deep connection. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to work for Gérard, it was uh, a, an absolute uh, wonderful uh, ex opportunity and experience that I could yeah, snap that up. <laughs> No, exactly. So first of all, I get to live in the most beautiful, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful places in the world because it's uh, very uh, wild here still, very untouched, um, as opposed to other regions in France that have been very much built up. Uh, we still remain uh, very, very wild here. Uh, even as far as tourism goes, it's a lot of, uh, you know, small, you know, hotels or camping, a lot of camping here and it hasn't just been built up like a lot of the Rivieras in Europe. So we're very lucky here. Um, another reason is uh, the fact that this region is one of the largest uh, regions that's under 
your organic and biodynamic viticulture. So as you know, I have kids and for me to raise my children in an agricultural area, it was important for me to not raise them somewhere where there was chemicals being sprayed everywhere and, and all the problems that come with that. So uh, I consider myself extremely lucky to, uh, to be here. And, uh, and Gerard's vision is absolutely incredible and his journey is incredible. So before I start on just kind of explaining the, the long duck and Gerard, I know everyone's probably thirsty and wants to get tastings. So we'll just <laughs> start with the first wine and then I'll kind of just go through it <laughs> with all of you. Uh, so the first wine is our Picoule de Pinet. Uh, so always identifiable uh, with the uh, long green bottle, which is the traditional bottle for Picoule de Pinet. Um, so pour yourself a glass. Uh, this uh, small appellation is a controlled appellation in France, so it's an AOC, um, and it has been an AOC quite recently, I believe in the 2013 or around there, it became an AOC, so it's, it's quite a recent AOC, um, but it has an extremely long history. So these wines uh, were adored by the Romans and then by uh, the, the monks and, you know, throughout history, the kings and queens in France. Uh, what's interesting about these wines is that Pique Poud is a grape that has a lot of acidity, a lot of freshness. And in the south of France, that's something that we don't find often with white grapes. So uh, we have extreme heats here. So to have this grape variety that holds on to this acidity and this freshness and is able to deliver uh, minerality uh, is quite exceptional. So it's something that I know I, I had a question about uh, the trends, um, but it's something that has been trendy and then less trendy and is coming back in trends and as we know a lot of trends are very cyclical so uh, right now seems to be a good time for Pique Poule in uh, a lot of global markets so it's exciting for us and it's exciting for me personally because I love wines with high acidity and I love that you know I'm always looking for wines that pair with seafood and oysters and and something that really is a vehicle to the salt and the limestone that we have in this region uh, and a lot of the varieties here the white varieties don't always convey that so to have a variety that does to me is, uh, is very fun and exciting. And it's also a great variety that always tends to be in a very accessible price category. You never yeah, find I'm it. always surprised at how accessible it is for a pick pool. And I wasn't sure if that was because it wasn't popular. So, you know, <laughs> like, oh, great. Okay, people aren't buying it. So the price is lower. So actually... You know i'll get it or whether there's some other reason but it's you know it's always good value for money absolutely um i don't know the reason why they've kept the price <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could it's tell you. It's going to go up, so everyone buy it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just buy it all up now. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, for me, it's always been a great value for money and something that I actually drink personally myself uh, regularly because it's, uh, it's quite unusual to have a wine like this here. And as you know, in France, uh, not only can we not really find a lot of wines from outside of France, which is very tragic for me, who loves wine <laughs> and who grew up in Canada where I had access to wines from all over the world. Uh, it even more than that remains very regional. So even here, I have a hard time finding wines from the Loire or wines from the Jura or whichever region. Like, it's very tough to find wines from outside of the Languedoc. So if I'm looking for a slightly different flavor profile, uh, it becomes challenge for me but picoud is something that always satisfies when i'm looking for something to pair with like i said those seafood and fish and and things that are a little bit lighter and saltier and fresh i think with that regionality then that you've picked a great place to live because Languedoc has such a range of wines doesn't it exactly that's actually what i wanted to talk about was the diversity that we have um we are i believe considered or officially the largest region in, uh, in the world for under vine. 
So we're considered the largest vineyard in the world. Um, so with that uh, came some problems back in the day when we were considered the wine lake of France, but nowadays is a huge asset and opportunity to us because we have so much diversity of terroir. So we have, I mean, we're basically between the Mediterranean. Um, we go quite far west, almost to, not to Bordeaux, but where you can start feeling the Atlantic influences in some of our far west vineyards. And then north, all the way up to the uh, foothills of the Massif Central. And then south, if you include the Roussillon, all the way down to Spain. So it's quite an interesting region. We're flanked between two major mountain ranges, which are the Pyrenees and the uh, Massif Central, and then between two oceans. So you can imagine between two mountain ranges and two oceans, all of the influences, the climactic influences and soil influences, it makes it very exciting to, uh, to find these kind of undiscovered terroirs. And is it also like, you could also argue that it's a region which is not maybe as regulated, even though there's an appellation controlé and it, it does absolutely have certain restrictions, but it does appeal to maybe perhaps more dynamic, innovative, creative, think outside the box kind of winemakers, because also it's not as expensive to buy exactly. land there too. So it, it appeals to people who want to make really interesting wines and not, you know, don't have the means to do so in other parts of France. It's a very good point. So yeah, no, so land here still remains less expensive than in other major wine growing regions in France uh, and does attract a lot of young, innovative winemakers that are looking to do things that are outside of the box. We are getting more and more regulated. So usually if you're doing things outside of the box, you'll be under a vin de France or a vin de pays or, you know, you or IGP as we call it here. But um Overall, it's, uh, it's a place where people feel very free to experiment, which is very fun. And uh, Gérard is, so he yeah. has that very innovative spirit and he's very experimental. And, and we have basically two uh, parts to uh, Gérard. So he's the son of a winemaker uh, who was the son of another winemaker. So he comes from generations of winemakers and uh, he started helping his father in the vineyards when he was 10 years old. So his dad, uh, he was uh, at that time playing rugby with his friends and his dad said, no, you're going to help me in the vineyard, but you'll thank me later because when you'll be 50, you'll have 40 years of winemaking experience or 40 vintages behind you. And he always tells that story because it, it holds very true to his heart. Um, when he was in his early 20s, his father passed away in a car accident very tragically. So he basically had to take over his father's domain or make the choice between taking over his father's domain or continuing his, at that time, very, very fruitful uh, rugby career. Um, so he took over his father's domain, which was our Chateau de Ville Manjou, which is in the Corbière. And from there, he really went to fulfill uh, this dream uh, in honor of his father to put the Languedoc on the map as a quality wine region in the world, which in the 70s and 80s was not necessarily the, the case at that time. So he um, bought over the many years uh, different chateaus in different uh, appellations and different areas of the Languedoc to showcase the diversity. And he also uh, started working with uh, growers, uh, buying grapes from them. And as he started his uh, uh, mission into organic and biodynamic winemaking, he um, encouraged these growers that we buy grapes from to follow this path. So paying higher prices for organically grown grapes. So he's been really instrumental in uh, how the long dog has really uh, swerved into this massive uh, organic haven that we, we have now. So it's been uh, an interesting and amazing journey. He's definitely known um, in the wine world for his innovation, both in styles and in, you know, all the bits and bobs around wine so like the packaging or the closures or you know always exploring something else and trying something new and not being worried about what the wine world says about it and going yeah. Absolutely. He's uh, what I would consider him like a, a hyperactive. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> he's always uh, you know innovating and he's always he's thinking 
10 steps ahead all the time. So as you can imagine, working with him is exhilarating and challenging because he's always 10 steps ahead of you. <laughs> if you have an idea, he's like, I thought about that 10, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so, so it's been really, really exciting. Uh, but no, he's, he's always playing around. And what's interesting is that he's always listening to his consumers. So he does what he wants. And so we have a lot of our vineyards and a lot of especially in our chateaus and our and our really like grand vin um this is he follows his heart and his soul and he's really making the wines that he wants to make that showcase really the terroir the appellation the history um but on the other hand he also makes wines that are consumer friendly where he's listening to what people want and and looking at the trends and and trying to make wine accessible to people and i know i had a question about millennials and that's something that we look at a lot because younger uh people are drinking millennials are, are looking at wine and they have different wants than you know other generations like my generation <laughs> so <laughs> so you have to be uh really attentive and uh he's he's able to do that he's able to really listen and and every market is different every china the us the uk japan there are so many different things that people are looking for so it's trying to um provide that but without losing the sense of self and the sense of place which is always the most important because how I, many wines do you guys produce sorry uh we have <laughs> it fluctuates <laughs> we have quite a few wines we have uh 15 chateaus uh, and domains. Um, they're all quite small, so they kind of operate as boutique wineries. Um, so we have about uh, a thousand hectares uh, under our chateaus and domains. Um, and then we have some of our larger vineyard areas where we work with growers and, and produce different lines. And so we can go anywhere between having 40 to 100 and plus wines, different labels, yeah, different brands because we have a lot of different distribution channels and different markets as well. Like what we're selling in Japan is not necessarily what we're selling in the US. How would you describe the consumer palette? Like, is, like I went to the one winery, for example, in Argentina, will not be named, and they deliberately made a Malbec for the American like market and a Malbec for the European market, and it was the same price but they just added like way more oak to the american market and it was like another one percent alcohol um how would you like can you have you noticed like any definitive differences between like europe versus the states i'm just like curious oh, yeah that's a very good question um it's like I was mentioning, it's important not to lose the the sense of place and uh, and and the sense of who he is and what he wants to do. So I don't think it, I haven't seen it go into an extreme where I'll say, "Oh wow, this wine that we're selling to the U.S. is very different than the same wine." quote unquote, that we're selling to another market. I haven't seen that, um, yeah. but there are definite wine styles that different. Uh, countries tend to prefer yeah but nothing nothing too extreme because yeah it's important to kind of still remain kind real yeah brings me on to um one of the questions because we had some questions ahead of time so uh yeah if any if um i didn't mention at the beginning if any of you are new to these sessions um there is a little uh chat box that you can chat in um collect uh, select all panelists if you just want to talk to us or all panelists and attendees if you want to talk to everybody and then there's a Q&A box if there are any specific questions that you want to make sure that we answer I will go through the Q&A's um, and make sure that all of those are answered before the end and um, but yeah we had some questions already um, before we started uh, tonight and um, one was asking about the rosé which will come on to taste in a in a moment um but with talking about the differences in um palettes and different countries kind of john bon jovi you've got to tell us this story <laughs> france to make a rosé with hamptons on the label and then selling it in the states mostly is that right <laughs> you got it exactly right so um 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's not even really a funny story. It's a really cute little story that uh, they and Gerard and uh, John Bon Jovi had some friends in common, and it had been a while, from what I understand, that uh, John's son uh, Jesse and his business partner Ali uh, they had been thinking about making a rosé. Uh, because they drink a lot of rosé in the Hamptons, and in the Hamptons, apparently, they equate them, or, you know, they have a, a very strong feeling of the south of France. So they think that their lifestyle is very similar to the lifestyle of the south of France, which is, eat, you know, eating good food, seafood, drinking rosé, conviviality, like the art of living, l'art de vivre. So it was very, uh, for in the Hamptons, apparently, from what I understand, they're very much, you know, the south of France of the United States. So, <laughs> so they drink a lot of rosé <laughs> in the Hamptons. And I believe the story goes that one day, uh, John was pouring some rosé for his son and he said, you know, have some pink juice. And they said and said, no, 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 this is Hampton Water. And so they they said, oh, that's actually a very good name for Rosé. Uh, let's, you know, think about creating this brand. And because of this really strong connection with the South of France, it didn't make sense for them to make a wine from California. And if you've spent any time in the U.S., East Coast and West Coast are, you know, <laughs> they're East Coast and West Coast. So it, <laughs> Yeah, they, they have a little, you know, turf war. So, so I think it made more sense for them for their Hampton consumers or for at least, you know, in the beginning, they were thinking just New York or Hampton consumers. It made more sense to call it Hampton Water. Um, and the success of it grew that they wanted to make it an international brand um, and try to make it speak to people internationally, uh, which has been really fun because the Hamptons, does speak to people, uh, people who travel a lot, and, and it's really geared towards those consumers that are, you know, like you said, millennials that spend time on social media, that travel, that, you know, visit their friends all over the world, and it's not some foreign land. The Hamptons is quite present in people's minds, and so is the south of France, so it seemed to be a good connection. Well, aspirational. I think mm -hmm. it's very aspirational. aspirational. Is the perfect word. <laughs> exactly. You also haven't been there, but everyone wants to go. You know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so it made sense, and uh, and it's actually been uh, been a very fun wine to uh, uh, to work with, and and the response has been great, and it's been fun working with a, a rock star, and him and Gerard have become best friends, <laughs> and Gerard's love of music, and it just it, it was the perfect fit. They. They both love music. They love to, they have very similar lifestyles. So it, it worked and, and they've become quite close. And John has been very involved in the winemaking process. So he discovered this love of, of uh, spending time with Gerard in the vineyards and doing blending sessions together. And yeah, so we saw him quite often at the winery, just hanging out in his, you know, boots and running around in the vineyards and yeah, it's been it's quite yeah not not what we're used to and his hair is short now I'm, i have this image of john bon jovi with his big hair from the 80s so <laughs> so it's very different but so uh, he's, he's, but he's actually you know he's making a quality wine he knows what he's talking about it's his taste or his and jesse's taste but with this i guess supervision or guidance the, so exactly. Gerard, Gerard. The definite guidance of Gérard, the savoir-faire of Gérard, uh, Gérard's ability to really, uh, definitely he knows the U.S. market quite well as well. So he'll say, you know, maybe this is to your taste, but it might not be you know, to the market's taste. So like you said, good guidance. I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's not really everywhere in the UK. Is it, is it mostly shipped over to the States and then a few pockets here? So the States has obviously been the main market. I believe it's a newer product in the UK. So I don't know how long it's been available in the UK, but it's it hasn't been as long as the US, definitely. Um, and then there are other little pockets in the world where it seems to be doing very well. And yeah, it's, it's a rock star wine. <laughs> yeah. how, how about that with celebrity? Because there's celebrity roses kind of popping up everywhere with Kylie this week. And, you know, obviously there's Brangelina and there's a few others. And it, you know, is is it that celebrity sales or is it that they 
just want to make their own wine and they're choosing rosé like is there a connection do you know it's interesting that you mention rosé particularly yeah i think it's it's uh it's very trendy it's uh easy to to drink to appreciate i think you know these celebrities love themselves drinking rosé so if they can slap their name on it they love it um but no it's i think people i'm not i don't know if people are buying the rosé because it's a celebrity rosé or because of curiosity or I, i'm not sure i don't know well maybe so, it's you buy that you the first time you buy it is the curiosity because it's a celebrity one and then because it tastes good you carry on buying it maybe because yeah. i was curious i was trying to find out when jihad actually made his first Rosé, because it is arguable to say that it was Whispering Angel in 2006, which really kind of took Rosé seriously and really, I think, helped make Rosé internationally renowned, gender fluid, guys could party order wine. It, it party wine. And, you know, you meet someone like Sasha Lachie, and again, that's a very interesting French-American background, so it can have the savoir faire, but also knows marketing and um i was just wondering if like because i just didn't know when jihad first started making rosé whether he'd seen like a really big increase really like in the last i guess like 10 years when that whole kind of empire of whispering angel also like was kind of like um yeah fueling it around the world yeah so gerard started making rosé a long time ago because he was making it on his uh his uh, father's property uh in the corbiere uh, which we actually still make today which is uh, chateau de ville majou uh, so we have a rosé that's been made there for forever um so rosé is actually uh, very historic to the languedoc roussillon and i don't know if everyone knows but it's actually um been credited to be originating from the Languedoc Roussillon, and I'm sure there's going to be people from Provence. <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm going to get like hate mail, but uh, but the the oldest historical records uh, in France uh, for rosé were rosés from Cabrières. Uh, which is a small appellation uh, here in the Languedoc Roussillon. And these were the wines that were drunk by uh, the kings and queens, the ones that were served in Versailles. So the longest historical records apparently uh, that they found uh, for rosé wine um, were from the Languedoc. So it's been, you know, Provence and the Languedoc Roussillon, it's kind of like East Coast, West Coast in the US. So, you know, they have their little <laughs> rosé war, but Gérard really wanted to bring rosé back to uh, the Languedoc Roussillon uh, and have people uh, understand that, yeah, Provence makes some amazing rosés, but the Languedoc also has the ability to, to make amazing rosés and that we have, again, a lot of diversity. So uh, we can make a lot of different styles here, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of different styles of terroir and climates and appellations. You make a barrel-aged rosé, don't you? Like one of oh. the really famous mm -hmm. ones. Yes, so even actually the uh, the Hampton water is uh, aged in barrel for uh, usually between three to six months. Um, so yeah, I would say we have, I would say about half and half. Half of our rosés are made in the very, you know, fresh style, no barrel aging. And then the other half that are meant for a little bit more uh, structure, a little bit more food pairing, maybe to age a little bit longer, are aged in barrel, including up to our top rosé, which is a... Uh, 200 pound. I saw uh, that one. That was the one I was thinking about. Yeah. Because I guess that maybe, yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, that's, a, that's a wine that we'll hopefully do one day together on one of these uh, <laughs> webinars. I would absolutely love it. It's the wine that I hold cl really close to my heart. Um, it's the uh, Clos du Temple, and uh, it's our second year, our second vintage, and we just got uh, voted best rosé in the world. And of course, we are by far the most expensive rosé in the world. But uh, it would be a really fun uh, wine to taste uh, one yeah. of these days together. Before that was Chateau Garousse, wasn't it? Yeah. Sacha Lachine's, that was the most expensive. And that would have been about 100 and something yeah 20 yeah and yeah. Uh, so we Gerard just you know took it to the next level <laughs> <We're out of water. laughs> next level <laughs> but uh but it's a it's an amazing one and that one is uh, barrel aged for uh between six to twelve months and uh it, the, it's just a complete different level of wine it's, is it almost like a white burgundy yes the people have compared it to that yeah Mm. Oh, I will try some. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a bottle right now. 
Put the water to this one. Which is a little more price friendly, a little more accessible. I'm actually going to go back to my Whole Foods because I, you know, because of COVID and now the tanks on my street, I haven't been wanting to leave the house for understandable reasons. But I have to go out today to get some food. And now I'm like, actually, my local Whole Foods has. Hampton water. So I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, actually I've been, so I'm tasting um, the, the Hampton water and I tasted the peak pool at room temperature. And even though it's stormy outside, it's still quite hot in my, in my house right now. I don't know if you can tell I'm sweating a little bit. It's still, we're at around 28 degrees here celsius so um so the wines are quite warm which is how i usually like to taste them to really be able to taste the wines and not have them be masked by by cooler temperatures and i'm really surprised by uh the level of freshness in this wine even at room temperature 28 degrees i don't know how you guys are tasting it if anyone wants to share their their notes yeah guys what do you think tell me make me jealous <laughs> I'm just on the iced coffee again. <laughs> well, you can, I'll just show you my bottle. I've been, I've been drinking it this week. So <laughs> oh. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. <laughs> fair, very fair. As I said, I'm, that's on the list this afternoon. Yeah, I'm actually, yeah, it's uh, the, the freshness and the acidity come through. Um, it's got bags of flavor, like, yeah. Often when you think of a, you know, Provence rosé, it's quite fresh, but citrusy and perhaps a little bit watery. So you kind of, you know, try and avoid those ones, the little watery ones. But yeah, this has got loads of flavour, lots of different characteristics. Mm -hmm. But without being uh, cloying or, or heavy, uh, it's still refreshing. It's something that you can drink uh, easily as an aperitif or pair with lighter foods. Because I think it's about $22. Does that make sense in the States? That sounds about right, yeah. 22 And so then in England, how much is it? Uh, I think it's somewhere 16 18 Yeah, no, that would make mm, That sounds correct. I mean, we did it as, as a package, so I don't know what the actual individual price was. Um, yeah, getting as a non rose drinker, I'm loving the complexity. Thanks, Dan. I'm glad you enjoy it. I mean, when, when we first started these webinars, um, I, was, I was doing a red, white, and rose to begin with, with all of them, and someone said, Can you stop doing rose so I can join? And uh, we've had more people join, even though we're still doing roses and they're loving yeah. them, which I'm, <laughs> I'm really yeah. proud of. No, it's great. I, th I think people you know, they need a bit of context, as they're not usual rosé drinkers, you know, and um, I, I think they're the most food friendly, versatile wine style. It's great. And it's great how like now when you see on wine lists, um, you know, they used to just have, uh, this is in UK and in the US, just rosé during the summer. And now you actually do have wine lists where they have their dedicated roses throughout the year, which is great. Because I mean, there's nothing better, quite frankly, when it's a really cold, miserable December day or January, February, glass of rosé is the best pick me up yeah I think it makes you think about sunshine doesn't it yeah this is that's a, a very good point it's something that we've been uh we've actually been been working with uh is to promote rosé as an all-year uh wine to have because in france more and more we're drinking rosé wine in the fall in the winter christmas time like when you think of christmas dinner rosé thanksgiving all of those christmas foods thanksgiving in the us and canada it's such a versatile wine that you can really drink all year round so of course you're going to find the majority of your rosé sales in the summertime but it's growing now all year round which is really exciting because I love rosé all the time. So. I mean, it's it's grown. In, in the UK, um, I worked in Majestic a couple of years ago, mm. and it was when we had that, the hottest summer. I was like, why did I choose the year when we had the hottest summer to work in Majestic? But anyway, um, I had the hottest summer and the longest hottest summer, and, you know, like no rain. And rosé was just unbelievable. That You know, the, the section of rosé was just, you know empty because we couldn't get it restocked fast enough and you know there's been a big boom in the uk i think there's a big boom in the us as well possibly other other 
countries as well. So that must be a massive opportunity for Languedoc and for Girard. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's very exciting. It's abs very very exciting. The the Languedoc Roussillon will always remain a a red wine uh, terroir, um, but uh, we do have the space to be able to also make a lot of wonderful Jose. So we're not we're not sacrificing our red wines to feed into you know the rosé trend. Uh, we can do it side by side. Luckily, did I? I might. I might get this wrong. It, um, I know, isn't that at least, it could be this rosé, isn't that one of your rosés we actually put in the Viognier grape? So whereas like in like Provence, they put in like Vermentino to kind of round it out, but there's actually yeah. like, you actually make use of like your native like white grapes. Yeah. You know, very, yes. It's, uh, well, it's I, our- I, like, I just want um, to try it. I love Viognier. So oh, I'm super good. impressed. That's very well. Uh, yeah, it's our, it's our rosé from uh, the Terrasse du Larzac area, which is in the uh, northern uh, part of the Languedoc Roussillon, uh, kind of near Montpellier, but uh, heading into the foothills. Um, and yeah, we do. We, uh, we actually do a co-fermentation of uh, red and white grapes to make uh, rosé. And Viognier is one of our grapes, which is quite unusual. It's it's called La Villa from uh, Chateau La Sauvageonne, and it's abs oh, and that was yeah, the flots coming out there, aren't they? Oh, it's so beautiful! And uh, a couple of years ago, for two years in a row, we were also voted uh, best rosé in the world back in the day for those two for two vintages of uh, mm -hmm. La Villa. So yeah, no, that's wow! I'm impressed that you know that. Very oh, no. good. You know, I, I'm a big Viognier fan, and I love Viognier from the Long Dog Resort. It's, it's different. Uh, you know, I'm not going to compare it to the Northern Rhone, but mm -hmm. um, there's yeah. really beautiful oh. expressions. Yeah, lovely. No, it's uh, and and seeing it co-fermented with Grenache, it's uh, yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> it's it's a very unusual technique, but it it works. And uh, and then that one also is aged in uh, oak barrels, and and it's definitely a more serious rosé. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, Wow. We still make it? We still make it, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's going to go, Amelia. <laughs> I know. It's like the jazz, the view on you. You guys all have to come. I'll be your personal <laughs> tour guide. <laughs> um, yeah, another, another thing that I find that I love about rosé is not just the liquid in the bottle, but because it's seen as kind of fun, flirty, young, it can do like you can do other things with it, you can be more experimental. And then Gerard is like, you know, innovative anyway. You know, you get things like, and this is a different rosé that I like, the Cote de Roses. Ah, the Cote de Roses, yeah. I mean, this look at this bottle, it's absolutely beautiful. I keep them and then I put little lights in them. I mean, it's just- Oh, cute. <laughs> so cute. I mean, if you can't see, so it's like a little rose that's actually yeah. so tactile. And yeah. just those kinds of things, those kinds of innovation in rosés, you can get away with. Whereas in other reds and whites, people look down on it and frown upon it. And I don't think that's how wine should be. You should make it fun. Fun, exactly. Fun, accessible. That's a really nice story with the uh, the Cote Rose bottle. He um, he went to a student uh, art show from a design school randomly, and uh, some artist, some young student artist had created it. So he bought it from this, this young student artist. He said, this is the most amazing thing. I need to have this and I need to bottle it. <laughs> so he, uh, he bought the, the design and that, yeah, it's, uh, it's incredible from this like young student and I think Paris and. Yeah. yeah. Such, such, again, you know, um, supporting young talent is, you know, such a admirable thing to do. Yeah, it's so. Very cool. Yeah. Does Gerard have a favorite wine he likes to make or I don't Oh, I, you know, I think it would be like asking him to choose between his children. I think, uh, no, I think he, he loves it all. And he's one of those crazy, you know, mad scientists and he's basically everywhere all the time. So the Long Dock is huge. It's a very, very large area from one end to the other. You can drive two hours and still not get to the other end it's, and drive quickly because we drive pretty fast in the south of France. So it's very, very big. And um, during, he controls everything. So during the harvest, um, he's basically driving around from vineyard to vineyard, deciding when we're going to harvest the grapes. So you can imagine it's a huge process between the whites, 
the reds, um, all the different varieties, the different terroirs, the different, you know, elevations. And he spends all of his time just driving around saying, okay, you know, and he has a Tesla, so it's an electric car because it, oh, it's a philosophy. Man. Yeah, so there's no petrol, you know, it's like, yeah. it's good. Um, but yeah, he really, he he's completely involved from, you know, the the time that the the vines are planted in the earth or picking the clones, selecting everything until the blending, which he's extremely in love with blending. He's, that's, I think the blending is almost more of his passion than anything, which in France and the South of France is one of the most important things is that most of our wines, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, outside from a few uh, exceptions, like the Picpoul or wines in the Limou, uh, most of our wines are blended wines. They're blends of different grapes from different terroirs, et cetera. So blending is extremely important. And that's where he really becomes this mad scientist, you know, really creating the perfect wine and, and yeah, he's fully, fully involved. And that's, it's, that's it's, amazing with the with the number of different types of wines that you guys are making for him yeah. to be that hands on. Like, I'm sure he could just sit back and go, "Yeah, you guys do it." But like, I'm pretty sure shot, he does. You kind um, of you get you, you get that because you know it's one of those names that if you're picking it off the shelf, you know it's good value for money. You know it's going to be quality and it's going to be delicious. And it's it's you know whatever price point his wines are you trust that that's going to be the quality of the wine inside and it's yeah it's it's one of those really trustworthy names and now you can see why if he's so involved and yeah and i see it i see it every day he you know sometimes you see him you know when he's doing events and you know he's wearing a business suit and you see him as this you know very you know business like character but in fact not at all he's he's really a man of the earth he's you know uh, has his hands dirty all the time you know he's really he's touching the soil he's touching the grapes his hands are purple he's blending his hair is all in disarray most of the time so he's really that that mad scientist of wine which is uh it's really exciting and 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 it's quality quality control because it's coming from the source you know it's coming from him yeah and his heart coming from his heart as well yeah, absolutely um, i've just got another another couple of questions about rosé before we move on to the red um so rosé in terms of um you know uk us and other countries when you when you look at it they they you know they're more popular among younger people and then kind of trail off to older generations whereas in france you've got a much flatter thing i'm guessing because they grew up with it essentially so you know they it's there's no kind of association of men don't drink pink or anything like that but with this boom in rosé is is that kind of pulling like your wines and longer dock wines over to other countries or to develop new things like how's that affecting you so so no i we are outside of france we are seeing that rosé drinkers are tend to be younger and tend to be more female uh but we're working also on making some packaging more accessible to male consumers because we found that a lot of men enjoy drinking rosé but don't necessarily want to buy a bottle with you know flowers all over it so we have, to, <laughs> we have to be conscious of that um but in france even though there is that old tradition of drinking rosé so you see old men at cafes drinking glasses of rosé the young people here are drinking it just as much if not more so uh we're becoming more in line with the international trends and and yeah i mean i think to hit up the older consumers in export markets might be a little more complicated um because they don't have that tradition of drinking rosé and older consumers tend to Kind of hang on to their traditions uh the younger consumers which are now getting older <laughs> because it's been <laughs> it's been a trend for you know a good 10 15 years <laughs> so we're finding that it's uh it's becoming accessible to everyone yeah hmm. great um have you got anything else amelia on the rosé i was just wondering because um I haven't seen all the rosés you make. Definitely in the US, people are scared still of the darker colored rosé. So I was just wondering, given the variety of grapes you have to blend with, if you did dare to mm. change ah. that 
yeah, go for a study. I love it. Um, wow. So no, in fact, um, you know, in France as well, uh, we have the same uh, type of idea where darker uh, means heavier and richer and potentially sweeter, uh, even though the wines from Tabet, I mean, it's, it's it, I don't know, it's just a conception that people have, even here. Uh, one of our, I, I believe the top selling rosé in France uh, is our Gris Blanc rosé, which is so pale, it's called Gris Blanc because it's literally uh, a gray color. It's made with Grenache Gris and Grenache Blanc. So it's barely pink. And, uh, and this is really the number one selling rosé in France. So I think that it's going to be a long time until people start looking and in the other direction of looking for those richly colored rosés. So we tend to be conscious about keeping our rosés on the lighter color side. Um, and I think that's something that we're going to see globally because i mean the u.s the u.s has other reasons for not wanting dark exactly. Blame <laughs> the blush. exactly. Yeah. exactly the trauma from those days so, so yeah no i think uh I, I don't see it changing anytime soon and for us we're we're conscious about it and and we're able to make sure that our rosés stay within the type of color that we believe consumers are are looking for and appreciate it. And if there is a change, you can change. Exactly, exactly. And even though personally I know better, you know, I still, when I'm shopping, I tend to go for paler colored rosés, even though I should know better. I get, I get into the trap. <laughs> I'm 100% in the trap. Um, let's move on to the, to the red. So, uh, Third wine is the Saint Finian. Ah, love this wine. Syrah Mavage. I think Mavage is such an underrated grape. I love it, and I love even just on its own as well. One of my favourites. Um, yeah. So, do you want to give us some notes on this? Absolutely. So Mourvedre, it's one of my favourite varieties as well. It's a variety that is can be excellent standalone, uh, but just is so exceptional in blends. And it's really the perfect grape for where we are located in Saint-Chignon and in other uh, areas uh, along the coast. Uh, even though Saint-Chignon is not really on the coast, it's a little bit further inland. I can bore you with the map, but I think probably most people know where it is or can look up a map on their phone. But we're further inland, but we still have a lot of influence from the Mediterranean Sea um, because we have a lot of strong winds in the south of France. We have very strong maritime winds and very strong northern winds. So we, even if we can be a 30-minute drive from the sea, we'll still have a lot of Mediterranean influence. And uh, Mourvedre is a grape where in France we say it's la tête au soleil, le pied dans l'eau, which means uh, the head in the sun and the feet in the water. So uh, it's a grape that thrives uh, in uh, these, like being close to the sea, but being in a very, very hot place that suffers from, you know, heat stress and drought. And so for us, it's a very important grape. We have it in a lot of our blends. And uh, the Saint Chignon for me, for value for money, I think is absolutely incredible. I tasted it uh, a couple hours ago, so it's actually been open a couple hours because I want to make sure the the bottle was showing well. But for me, the the sense of place is very present in this wine. Um, Saint Chignon is uh, there's a mix of different soil types. There's some schist, there's some uh, limestone and clay. Um, some of the more age-worthy ones are more on um, limestone. So uh, most of the grapes that we source for this wine are from the limestone soils that are a little bit further south. Um, and we're surrounded by Garrigue. And uh, for those who don't know, Garrigue is um, it's this wild uh, brush, brush land or bushland um, where you have uh, aromatic herbs that grow uh, wildly, uh, mostly rosemary and thyme and sage and juniper and wild fennel. Um, and because we have this very strong wind coming from the north called the Tramontane, so it's similar to the Mistral, but instead of being north to south, more in the Rhone Valley, it's kind of more um, northwest to southeast and really hits us directly in saint chinian and pretty much most of the coastal Languedoc. Um, this wind actually carries 
uh, some of the, the oils, these oils from these herbs onto the grape skins. So we actually find these little molecules of oils on the grape skin. So when we ferment, the wine actually contains these essential oils from these herbs. So you find a lot of notes of uh, thyme and rosemary and what we call garrigue. And that's really strong because of the, the, the tramontan wind. I mean, you mentioned the value for money and just explain to Hua, it's, you know, it, it absolutely explains it, but it's just funny. Is it a bit of a hard sell places like Saint-Chinien, La Clap, like those kind of areas? There's people outside of France, even people within France themselves, won't realize just how amazing the terroir is and how it's like getting an exceptional Rhone site or an exception, you know, they, they just won't, like for people in the trade, they'll be like, oh yeah, I know I'm going to be getting this exceptional minerality like from the Gary and like da 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 da. How do you go about really marketing that for consumers who have no idea? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's education. Uh, it's, you know, tourism. It's getting as many people as we can to come down here and experience. Uh, it's having, you know, the right people that are, you know, working with us. Uh, you know, people who love the South of France, who want to promote it whether it's journalists or influencers or, you know, people who just want to talk about it with the consumers and just get them to understand or, or find, discover, basically discover this region. Because yeah, they're amazing value for money. It's to be able to get these flavors and this complexity and the sense of terroir for these prices is, you're not going to find it in many places in the world. And the ageability. Absolutely, yeah. And the versatility. I found the Saint Chignon, I was actually in the UK, funny enough, and I had a dinner, this wine dinner in uh, at the Shard, the Oblix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it was quite a few years ago, and the sommelier there at the time paired the Saint Chignon with fish. And when I saw it on the menu, like a white fish. And when I saw it on the menu, I was like, oh, someone made a mistake. I don't know. Blah blah blah. <laughs> I was, you know, panicking a little bit. And I tasted it and it was absolutely incredible. It paired perfectly because it's not very tannic, it's very fresh. Um, and it just the way they prepared the fish paired amazingly well with the Sachignon. And it completely changed my view of food and wine pairing. And I've been a sommelier for almost, yeah, almost 20 years. And this just blew me away completely. So there you go. Thank you, UK sommelier. I can't remember his name. I should. <laughs> but he just completely changed my mind. And it was with the Saint Chignon. So, yeah. Wow. There you go. Versatility. Mm-hmm. And then, like, we're getting, like, lots of um, lovely comments in the, in, the, in the box. Still about the rosé as well. Um, but also, you know, the information that you're giving on this uh, webinar is wonderful, really. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we've still got one more question that I've got. Anyone else, if you have any more questions, do pop them in the Q&A um, box. I don't want to keep Vanessa too long because, uh, you know, she has kids. <laughs> well, that's like, you want to get to <laughs> And it's an hour later. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, would be, um, we, uh, we want to talk about climate change a little bit and how that's impacting, like, your vineyards, the varieties. I mean, have you had to change a lot? Ah, so this is a very good question. So we actually, I, one of my closest friends uh, in the world um, is uh, Michelle Bouffard. I don't know if anyone's heard of her. She hosts a um, tasting climate change seminar uh, in Montreal every year for the last uh, couple of years or few years, um, which has been the most incredible experience. All the best sommeliers. And if you can check out Tasting Climate Change uh, on the internet, it's really this amazing symposium that she's uh, put together. So she's come to visit us quite a few times and we've had a lot of conversations together regarding the subject. Um, and she's just a wealth of knowledge uh, and I'm not at all. So I'll just give you the, the basics of what, what I understand. But in the South of France, we've been lucky in a way that we have always dealt with quite extreme climates um, and extreme heat, most of all. So we've always 
uh, been adapting to, to heat here, which means that we've always planted uh, heat resistant varieties or the most heat resistant varieties, um, playing with crossings. Um, so it's in actually Montpellier where uh, they created, I think it was in the 1950s, crossings like Caladoc or Marcelin, which was crossing uh, Grenache with either Cab Sauve or Malbec or, you know, whatever, in order to uh, have these vines that were a little more resistant to heat. It so for is that the actual grapes then, or is that for grafting to grow other grapes on? No, no, for the actual like variety. That so we're you're using. getting new varieties. You, yeah, we're creating new varieties basically by crossing two varieties together. It was usually Grenache with a, a Bordeaux variety that were crossed together. So we've been playing around and experimenting. And actually, with Gérard Bertrand, we use uh, in some of our blends uh, some of these varieties because they're varieties that have adapted very well to. Um, being very heat resistant. And then we also have our native varieties like um, in La Clap, we have a white variety called Bourboulinc, uh, which is uh, quite heat resistant and uh, um, can produce wines that still have a lot of like finesse, even in extremely high temperatures. Um, so there's that, there's playing around with varieties. Uh, there's also just uh, the where we plant our grapes so it's more and more we're planting our grapes at higher elevations or looking for the hills and looking for cooler areas so uh, we're planting more in the Limou or further uh, west in uh, the Malper which is a very small appellation um, very west of uh, so almost southwest of the Languedoc uh, or uh, on the opposite in the Massif Central like the Terrasse du Larzac which is quite high. So where we're going to find some day and night temperature variations and give the grapes a little bit of a break. Um, so there's that. And then there's also uh, biodynamic. We, uh, that's very, very important for us to uh, mitigate uh, the, the heat uh, stress in the grapes. So we will usually do um, applications of uh, yarrow or nettle, um, which are, we make them into herbal teas. Um, so we'll put like a certain amount of grams per liter of water and then spray the vines with it. So it's kind of a herbal tea treatment or like almost like a homeopathic treatment. Um, and this helps the vines during like moments of extreme uh, heat stress or yeah, climactic uh, stresses. Even frost. Like, like when we put tea tree on our eyes or something. Exactly, yeah. Or drink chamomile tea when we're stressed out. You know? <laughs> or valerian. It's pretty much kind of the same thing. So, so that's been for us a, a very big help. But yeah, so it's mostly playing around with varieties, playing around with location. And, uh, and then trying to promote, you know, on a bigger scale, uh, biodiversity, you know, environmental uh, consciousness and all of that for the global climactic change. I'm glad Gerard drives a Tesla. Yeah, I know. I've driven with him. It's very, very scary. <laughs> he drives very fast. Because <laughs> you can't, you know, you can't really feel it when you're in a Tesla. You're like, oh, fast. <laughs> but yeah, he drives a Tesla. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tried to convince him to get all of his staff Teslas. I'm still working on it. So... So are there actual Tesla charging stations near you guys? The there absolutely North? are. Yeah, at our winery, we have Tesla charging stations. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and in the towns, it's uh, it's quite popular here in the south of France. You see quite a few really? Teslas. Yeah. Amelia, I think we should do a road trip in a Tesla. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm I recommend it. <laughs> I wear the era Provençal, like, long dock dress. Yes, I'd wear this in my... You're ready. Yeah, now we just need some airplanes. <laughs> we just need <laughs> flights. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it's amazing. I just um, like just on on talking about those varieties. So, do you think we're going to be seeing those new varieties like on the labels? Are they going to, you know, maybe over time, or is it going to just be part of red blends, almost hidden to begin with? Well, here for us, probably not so much because here we rarely put the varieties on the label, like on the front of the label, we'll mention them in the back of the label, but on the front, we don't do varietal wines. So yeah. it's unlikely that you're going to find a Gérard Bertrand Caladoc. Um, <laughs> but we do, we do um, talk about it when we have master classes or discussions or whatever. It's something that comes up because sommeliers and consumers are really interested in finding about 
these varieties that they haven't heard of before. So it's always a topic of conversation. But I know that Bordeaux has just allowed, I think a few months ago, they just allowed a bunch of new varieties. I think one of them, I think, was even Marcelon uh, into their blends, which you can see that they're becoming... Yeah, conscious of what's happening and and well, yeah, really right. to look and find out anyway. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful! Thank you so much, Miss. I've not had any more questions, so I'm hoping we've answered everybody's. Um, we've got like Peter sharing so much information. Thank you, Peter. Um, and we've got lots of uh, lots of thumbs up from Marsha, Tessel, Karen. Yeah, enjoying the wines, which I love to hear. Um, yeah, and it's it's been a pleasure having you on, Vanessa. Thank you Thank so you. much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, you so, so, so much. Yeah. Definitely did transport us. Well, I hope that this yeah. is just the, uh, the appetizer and that the main course will be when you all are able to come and visit. And like I said, um, you know, it's, we have an open door. So as soon as things are, are able to return into a way where you know, traveling as possible and visiting as possible, I will welcome you with open arms because uh, you can find my information easily. I don't know if you can share my, my email address, but I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Any wine lover is welcome and I will personally also guide them and, you know, take them around and, and show them what we're doing because it's, uh, it's really I'll share your email address with the, um, with the attendees because I, I always do an email the next day to say thank you for attending so I'll, I'll include that information in there thank you that's really kind thank you. thank you so much thank you this has been such a fun experience oh no it's been great you've been very really fun fantastic. thank you <laughs> I think that was a clamor for Soma to organize a group trip next year for the jam yeah so if anyone yeah. wants to go next summer we do a group trip then email me and I'll uh, I'll sort something out I love it I love it you're all invited <laughs> Um, right, let me just change um, the screen. Should have done this earlier. Um, yeah, so next week uh, we're talking to Katerina Bellanova at San Marzano. Um, three reds next week, so we're not doing a red, white, rosé as we've uh, been tempted to. It's just three reds and we're going through these um, Primitivo Negro Amaro, um, which are native grapes to Puglia, which is the heel of the boot in Italy. Um, yeah, really looking forward to talking about those. Um, probably won't be too geeky, so yeah, come back and join us. And yeah, let me know your questions in advance if you're if you're going to be joining along. All right. <laughs>